Good morning. On behalf of the entire Connecticut College community, I want to welcome you to today's 104th commencement ceremony. Please be seated. Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion, Rodman King, will begin our celebration today by delivering our land acknowledgement, which will be followed by a call to community. As a gentle reminder, to make this ceremony as respectful and as uh, seamless as possible, we ask you to silence your cell phone. I now ask Dean King to come forward and initiate our program. I would like to take a moment on behalf of the college to acknowledge the land that we currently occupy and to honor the native peoples who were its first inhabitants. Specifically, we honor the Mashantucket, Pequots, Eastern Pequots, Mohegans, and other native nations who are indigenous to Na Mi Al, now called New London and the land surrounding coastal Algonquin, also known as the Long Island Sound region. We acknowledge that indigenous peoples have cared for this land over many generations. And we know that they endured suffering and violence through the historical period of settler colonialism and its legacy. Today, we strive to tell and retell the complete stories to repair the harm to restore, and to live together as neighbors in this region. Having acknowledged the land, I would like to invite us into communion with one another. I'll offer an excerpt of a poem by Amanda Gorman entitled, Another Nautical. Relationship. Life has taken the suffix ship and made it a verb, taken sound and given it momentum. That's what only words can do, prod us towards something new, and in doing so, move us closer together. Perhaps our relationships are the very make of us. Fellowship is both our nature and our necessity. We are formed primarily by what we imagine. There is truly unity that requires no they for us to be threatened by. This is the very definition of love. We've never had to hate a human. To hug another never had to be fearful. To be fond of the hearts beating out to us this whole sealess wreck. We have sought not yellow land, but our fellow man, the shores mapped only by one another. It is now my distinct honor to welcome the president of the college, Catherine Bergeron. Thank you, Dean King. Members of the Board of Trustees and distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and alumni colleagues, family members and friends, all who are gathered on this magnificent green and all who are watching from afar, and most especially, every single one of you who makes up the astonishing class of 2022 I cannot tell you how honored I am to stand before you on this beautiful morning and to declare today's exercises, the 104th commencement of Connecticut College, officially open. It really is moving to see all of you soon to be graduates sitting alongside the people who made this moment possible. 
the faculty and staff who awakened your sensibilities and nurtured your talents, the alumni who paved a way for you, the friends who shaped your experience here and who will remain in your lives as you move off this hill and rise to the next challenge. And above all, the family members who were there before any of us as your first teachers and guides. It's moving because we have all lived through so much in the last two years. But if there is one thing that this period of separation and loss has taught us, it is to recognize the incredible honor it is to be together like this, to be part of this unique community. And so I have to begin by expressing my gratitude to all of you for the ways you kept showing up online or on campus, in masks and in person, with candor and grace during periods of calm or crisis, as listeners and problem solvers who shared your fears and hopes and precious moments of joy. Commencement is a day of honor, and I suppose what I'm saying is that what is being held up today is not just individual achievement, but something you accomplished together. The honor belongs to all of you. Of course, the main honor being bestowed today is what we call the baccalaureate, or the Bachelor of Arts degree. The term baccalaureate comes from the Latin baccalauri, meaning fruit of the laurel. In ancient Greece, as you may know, it was customary to honor victors with a crown of laurel leaves. And so the earliest universities expressed the fruits of academic victories in analogous terms. The actual chain of laurel leaves you just walked through harks back to that classical tradition. There are laurels beyond the baccalaureate. Some of you received academic honors from your departments by writing exceptional theses or being awarded special prizes. Others have received the distinction of what we call Latin honors, the words cum laude or magna cum laude or summa cum laude added to your diploma, noting that your degree carries with it an extra measure of lauda or praise. Others of you were recognized with membership in Phi Beta Kappa, the country's oldest honor society. One person today, our keynote speaker, Deborah Beal, will be receiving a special degree, a doctorate of humane letters, honoris causa, which means in Latin, for the sake of honor. And yet another person, Caroline Grape from the class of 2022, will be awarded the baccalaureate posthumously. And this too is for the sake of honor, not for requirements fulfilled, but as a mark of esteem for contributions made to the community and to society. It's this, it's this larger sense of honor that I want to focus on in my remarks today. Because at Khan, as you all know, we have one more way that we think about honor. And that is through a code of honor that each of you agreed to adopt as you became members of this community. There is a document you all signed, in fact, back in 2018. On the same day, we gathered on Temple Green to mark the college's 104th convocation and the official start of your Khan education. It is a pledge that you would take responsibility for yourself and others by upholding the values of this community. And it has been displayed publicly in Crow ever since as a daily reminder of your collective commitment. I went over to Crow to look at it the other day, and as I recognized your names through the scrawl of signatures, I thought about how you couldn't possibly have known on that day what being a member of this community would mean. How you couldn't have known that you would end up publishing a paper with a professor or giving a talk at an academic conference, or directing a major production, 
or producing an album of your own music, or filling a gallery with your art, or serving with faculty, staff, and senior administration in making decisions during a public health crisis, or helping admit the class of 2026, or founding a children's library in Afghanistan, or doing collaborative research with students on three continents, or winning a post-baccalaureate fellowship abroad, or leading your teammates to victory, and even capturing the college's first ever national championship. You couldn't have known the honors that were to come when signing that code. But I want to suggest that at least part of the reason why these things happened is because you did. Honor is a public agreement the byproduct of collective obligation. You may know that this academic year marks the 100th anniversary of the Honor Code at Connecticut College. And I often like to use this occasion to delve into a bit of our history. So as you come full circle today, gathering on this green now for the college's 104th commencement, I want to linger on that pledge you signed in order to reflect on its origins, its impact, and on the ways it can continue to shape your lives beyond Connecticut College. The first thing to say is that Connecticut College is really one of just a few colleges in the country defined by a completely student adjudicated honor code. The next thing to say is that the code itself emerged as the direct outcome of a tradition of shared governance, one that goes back to the college's beginnings. In our very first year of operation, the faculty of this college formally charged students with managing their own affairs in non-academic matters, leading to the institution of student government. It was a big step, one that the first president, Frederick Sykes, recognized as having created the conditions for the high ideals of conduct that, as he put it, give community life its highest sanction and most lasting satisfaction. Self-government, then, became the impetus for a new kind of community bound by honor. That was 1916. Five years later, in 1921, the students institutionalized it in a code to live by. They called it the Student Government Oath, and in it they pledged four things. Never to dishonor the college, to uphold the values of the community both individually and collectively, and to help those who might falter, to grow the sense of collective obligation, and ultimately, quoting from the final phrase, to render our alma mater greater, worthier, and more beautiful. You are quite familiar with these actions because 100 years later, it is still the code we live by. The words of the code were said to be drawn from the Ephebic Oath of ancient Athens, a vow taken by young men following their military training, a kind of pledge of allegiance that obliged them, as soldiers and citizens, to protect their city. Of course, the college version removes all reference to combat, and the object of loyalty, too, shifts from a city to a school. But what remains across time is the sense of shared obligation born of collective self-governance. Now, I'll admit, this is a somewhat elusive thing to talk about. And often, when we try to explain our honor code today, we default to its ancillary benefits. Your ability to take unsupervised exams on your own schedule. Your ability to leave your door unlocked or your things unattended without concern. But these examples actually miss the point. What the code gives us is something far more valuable a symbiotic relationship between trust and obligation that produces the kind of respect that ultimately makes life in a community, as President Sykes suggested, worth living. In other words, 
the code can be understood as the key to a good life. Interestingly, this is one of the points that the philosopher Anthony Appia makes in The Honor Code, his 2010 book on how moral revolutions happen. Noting the relative neglect of honor as a topic in modern moral philosophy, Appia wants to rehabilitate a place for honor in our thinking about what it is to live a successful human life. He takes his cue from Aristotle, who understood the good life through a condition Aristotle called eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness, but as Appia reminds us, is better understood in terms of all the ways we flourish in community. Appia sees honor as a crucial aspect of that human flourishing, again, because of the way the elements of trust, obligation, and mutual respect connect our lives together. Honor is an engine, he says, fueled by the dialogue between our self-conceptions and the regard of others that drives us to take seriously our responsibilities in the world we share. Honor, in a word, takes integrity public. So why am I spending so much time talking today about a 100-year-old honor code just at the point when you were about to be free of it? It's to make a simple point, really. I want to remind you, on this day of honor, that one of the most precious things you are taking with you from your time at Khan may well be the shared sense of honor that this code has instilled in you. As I said at the outset, that is not just an individual, but a public achievement, something you accomplish together through your own acts and also through your commitment to others who fail in their responsibility. And here's my final point. Just as you now see the honors that flowed from accepting membership into this community, I believe that if you continue to live by this code, you will see even greater things in your lives beyond Khan. And not only that, you will also stay connected to each other through the knowledge that each of you, wherever you may be, is making your communities greater, worthier, and more beautiful by contributing to their collective flourishing. Class of 2022, we love you. We are proud of you. We know the lessons you took from this place will remain with you as you go into the world to do good. Thank you for honoring us with your talent, your passion, your commitment, and your trust. We wish you much happiness and success in your lives beyond Connecticut College, and we look forward to seeing you back here often and welcoming you home. Thank you. And now we've arrived at the part of our program when we will hear directly from a member of the class of 2022. Now our tradition at Connecticut College is to select the senior orator through a competitive nomination process open to the entire senior class. Among an impressive group of nominees, the student you are about to hear today stood out for her creative expression and approach to life on campus during historic times. Originally from Williamsburg, Massachusetts, she is an English major and a scholar in our creativity pathway, known across campus for the quality of both her poetry and her prose. During her time at Connecticut College, she has been the recipient of multiple honors and awards, including the Sally Abrams Class of 75 Prize in Fiction just this year, and a two-time winner of the Benjamin T. Marshall Prize for Excellence in Poetry. Her artistry goes beyond the written word to include analog photography and digital art. At the All College Symposium this past November, she gave a thoughtful exposition on the ways these forms of fixed media interact with time and matter in our physical world. Last year, while taking classes remotely at Khan, she was engaged in a set of her own creative independent projects in Madrid 
After graduation, she plans to continue her work as an artist while living abroad. Won't you please join me in welcoming the 2022 senior class orator, Emma Gould. Class of 2022, esteemed faculty, dedicated staff, loving parents and families, friends. It is a great honor to be here before you today and welcome you to Connecticut College's 104th commencement. This day means something different to all of us. Recently, I spoke to a friend in the graduating class who told me she wasn't sure if she would attend commencement. When I asked why, she told me that she expected today to be too sad, that she would be overwhelmed by how this ceremony would force her to acknowledge our departure from this beautiful community that we have had the privilege of being part of for the past four years. As I see her sitting here today, I want to offer you the same words I offered her. I encouraged her to look at this day as a beginning rather than an ending. As an English major and a writer, I often examine the language we use to describe our experiences. So, class of 2022, I want to remind you that the word commencement itself denotes a beginning, a beginning act or fact of coming into existence. Beginnings are forward-looking and are, of themselves, a direction. What direction do you think you'll be taking, honey? My father is on the phone wishing me a happy 21st birthday. I answer with silence while he contemplates aloud the advantages of training programs over graduate school. My father thinks the question is his and wants an answer for his asking. These days, I no longer ask these questions aloud, but hear them in my sleep and in my waking and answer them second by second. I think about what it will be like to leave this place. Who will I be in the real world? What will my friends be doing? When will I return to the places that I leave behind? Then I remember that we've done it before. When the pandemic hit in March 2020, I drove to Cannes to collect my belongings and didn't set foot on campus for a year. There was none of the teary-eyed sentimentality that had accompanied freshman year move out. I thought we would all be back on campus by April or May at the latest, with the pandemic fading in the rear view, just as the last streaks of snow were melting off of Temple Green. We would stretch out on the bright grass and sink back into the feeling of normalcy. But that didn't happen. Scattered like stars, we waited to find out when we would return to college. Spread out across the world, many of my peers dealt with the challenge of logging on to remote classes whose meeting times were based on Eastern Standard Time. Rubbing sleep from my eyes in my morning Zoom class, I would see the sky darken behind a classmate who was at home in Berlin, Germany. Early on, we all had questions. Will we ever go back to school? Will we ever have another Floralia? Will we ever have another normal semester? Will we ever all be together again? Over time, these looming questions began to be filled in by something other than answers, replaced instead by our ability to adapt, this culture of creativity and care that swells from our community began to offer us guidance 
Rather than compressing my world to fit the frame of a computer screen, this distance offered perspective, and the significance of our ties to this community grew. The faithfulness to exploration and connection that this college fosters gave us direction to navigate through this challenge. One November morning, I stared at my classmates' faces, lined up and stacked on top of each other, each one in a little box on my glowing computer screen. I remembered chilly walks to Harris in the winter months when I would look up and see the glowing rows of windows illuminated against the dark blue dusk. Eventually, the time came when I would once again see dorm rooms lit up against the dark evening. We came back together this past fall, all of us in one place again. Things had changed, though. Now, we were the oldest on campus, but my friends and I joked that readjusting to being back on campus sometimes felt like we were starting freshman year all over again. As I got my bearings, I noticed that our time spent apart hadn't made us strangers. Back on campus, among all of the new students, the familiar faces of the class of 2022 stood out like old friends. We were the only remaining class that had known a normal year. We were linked by our shared history, set apart by our knowledge of how things had once been. As turn of the century babies, our resting state has never been normal. A certain kinetic motion has enveloped us as we've grown. Over these past four years, Connecticut College served as a lens through which our kaleidoscope of experiences can filter through and reflect back to us. We keep each other charted on a course that our parents can't see. My direction is calculated in relation to my friends and peers, and theirs in relation to mine. Once, I read a famous poem that I remember saying, the heart is like a compass, that it swings in all directions and always returns to true north. It's like so many phrases, passages, old remembered lines, that I've scribbled down on stationary gum wrappers and open notebooks. Like a small town that finally makes the maps and can then be located in distance and direction from other towns and roads, our relationships to each other and to this place gives us true north. Our connectedness gives us roads, fences, and windows to which our own ideas and experiences bear some relation. After we leave this place, the needles on our compasses will swing back here and we'll see how far we've gone. To answer my father's question, in dance class, 60 bare feet point towards the mirror at once. 29 left legs sweep forward on the floor. I stand in fourth position, two feet going in opposite directions, my gaze in a third direction, straight ahead, I didn't tell my father that it's when I'm going in three directions at once that I know exactly where I am. Congratulations, class of 2022. We have so many good things ahead of us. And now please welcome Dean of the Faculty, Jeffrey Cole. Thank you, Emma. I am very pleased to be here today to present the Oaks and Louise Ames Prize for 2022. The Oaks and Louise Ames Prize is named for the late President Emeritus Oaks Ames and for his wife, Louise Ames. It is given to a graduating senior who has completed the year's most outstanding honors study. The prize is offered by the trustees in recognition of the quality of academic achievement that Oaks and Louise Ames fostered during their 14 years of service to Connecticut College. This year's Ames Prize is awarded to Hannah 
Tanabe. Hannah, will you please come forward? Here she is. Hana is the East Asian Studies major and a theater minor. She's receiving the Ames Prize for her honors thesis, Living as Art, Performance and the Haunting of the Japanese Diaspora. Hana's work is an auto-ethnographic narrative interwoven with scholarly analyses of Japanese and Japanese American artists and their performances. She explores how Japanese and Japanese American artists use embodied practices of memorialization to address the erasures and absences in narratives of racialization, displacement, and migration. Hana analyzes the performances of three artists, Aise Kondo, Rea Tajiri, and George Takei, and uses them as inspiration to trace the past of her own grandfather, Santoro Tanabe who had been part of the Japanese art movement in the 1960s and to excavate his story. Weaving sections of autoethnography throughout her analyses, Hana takes readers through her own journey toward understanding the impact of collective trauma and diasporic experiences on identity as she grapples with the intergenerational impact of Japanese American incarceration in the United States during World War II and comes to terms with the gaps in her own family's memory. The result recasts understandings of Japanese American history and performance and reveals how Japanese American diasporic identity is not solely defined by a violent moment in history, but also a shared sense of the racialized and diasporic experiences of loss and memory. Hana's thesis advisor, Ayako Takamori, assistant professor of East Asian languages and cultures, called her work exceptional. <laughs> Adding that, quote, Hana's weaving in of her personal and family history is exemplary of the potential of autoethnography to provide an avenue of connectivity between the personal and the political of historical specificities of experience and the structural dimensions of racialization, displacement, and erasure. Hana Tanabe, for your outstanding scholarship, I am pleased to present you with the 2022 Oaks and Louise Ames Prize. Congratulations. Let's hear it for Hana. I now invite Erica Smith, Dean of the College, to come forward and present the Anna Lord Strauss Medal. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're here. It's my privilege today to present the Anna Lord Strauss Medal for Exceptional Scholarship and Community Activism. This year's medal is being awarded to Jacob Nazaki. <laughs> Jacob, will you please join me at the podium? Strauss was a remarkable woman who embodied the idea of service. In her role as national president of the League of Women Voters, in her five presidential appointments to national and international committees and missions, and in her devotion to Connecticut College as a trustee for the extraordinary term of 32 years. The medal is presented in her honor to the graduating senior 
who has done outstanding work in public or community service, including service to the college. This year's recipient is a conscientious and compassionate contributor to shared governance, an engaged scholar and collaborative community builder, a computer science major, psychology and German studies double minor, and scholar in the Tor Cummings Center for International Studies and the Liberal Arts. Jacob has demonstrated a serious commitment to service across the institution, as well as to his fellow students, the New London community, and academic and marginalized communities around the world. Since joining Connecticut College as a sophomore transfer student, Jacob has represented his peers for all three years as a member of the Student Government Association, hence the big hug because this is how we got to know each other this year. Jacob also served on 10 college-wise committees and working groups. He has made significant contributions to his fellow students' learning experience in and out of the classroom, serving as a German language table host and as a teacher's assistant in computer science courses. Extending his impact far beyond campus Jacob is a co-founder of the Global COVID-19 Project, which brings together students from across the world to share research and information regarding their experience during the pandemic. And co-founder of the Summer Language Challenge, a structured virtual language learning platform which created opportunities for students across the world to learn new languages or build their skills in languages they had already been studying. Jacob has also volunteered with, pa with Paper Airplanes, an organization that provides support and skill development for refugees, and created videos and other outreach materials for local health organizations in the city of Santarém in Para, Brazil. Jacob Nazaki. For your exemplary work as a citizen and scholar, I am very pleased to present you with the 2022 Anna Lord Strauss Medal. I now welcome President Bergeron back to the podium. So can we have one more round of applause for these exceptional students? <laughs> Congratulations. And now I would like to invite Karen Quinn Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees and a member of the class of 1987 to join me for the conferral of the honorary degree. I ask Deborah Beal to come forward. Deborah Beal. Your vision for creating more equitable college admissions has been transformative for generations of both students and higher education leaders. And Connecticut College is proud to honor you today. It was just two years after your commencement from Brandeis University, where you received a Bachelor of Arts in American and English Literature, that you had the inspiration to start a new organization to support talented, underrepresented students in their college journey. You later called that organization Posse, after hearing a student lament that he would never have left college if he had found his Posse. Your vision was to serve highly selective colleges in bringing teams of high achieving students from the same city to pursue higher education on their campuses. That simple idea turned into one of the most successful college leadership programs in the country. Since 1989, the Posse Foundation has matched more than 10,000 students with 1.6 billion 
in leadership scholarships from more than 60 partner colleges and universities. For these efforts, you won a 2007 MacArthur Genius Fellowship and earned a reputation as an exceptional leader in the field of college access, persistence, and student success. In 2010, President Obama named Posse as one of the 10 nonprofits with whom he would share his Nobel Prize. By then, you had gone on to earn a master's and doctoral degrees from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Today, your commitment to equity in higher education is evident in your work not just as CEO and founder of Posse, but also as a member of the Brandeis University Board of Trustees. In recognition of your commitment to opening the doors of access for literally thousands of underrepresented students, and with praise for your talent in fostering campus environments where all students reach their full potential, Connecticut College is proud to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Deborah Beal, in recognition of your many achievements and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and pursuant to their vote, I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, with all the attendant rights, privileges, and responsibilities. And now we have a little thing to do. So first, here is the honorary degree. <laughs> and next. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating Deborah Beal. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's really cool to be up here. I wish you could see what it looks like. Thank you. Okay. Well, to President Bergeron, who is the most stylish president I have ever met, excellent glasses and shoes all the time, and what a great speech. To the Vice Chair, Karen Quint, to the entire board, the faculty, the staff, to the whole community here at Connecticut College, thank you so much. Actually, really thank you so much for including me in this special day. It's been two years since I've been on a college campus, and what a day to come back. It's beautiful. Congratulations to all the graduates today, and a special congratulations to the Posse Scholars. One hundred percent of this tenth Posse is graduating and I'm so proud of you and so honored to be part of your, your class. Um, I also want to send a special shout out to your new Dean of the College, Erica Smith. You know why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because she is also a Posse alum. I can't tell you how that makes me feel. I've known her since she was 17 years old. And to see her today as the dean of the college, she will be presenting the, de the, the degrees to your president, who will then confer the de your degrees upon you. And it's just incredible. And I'm, it's an honor to be on stage with you, Erica. <sighs> OK. Anyway, you've had a really tough past few years. And to be here today, as everyone on stage is saying, Emma gave such a great speech, didn't she? 
Or to be here in the sunshine and we can feel the breeze together. We can see each other's shoes. It's just a good feeling. To the families, right? What a moment this is. A little over two decades ago, you were celebrating the birth of a brand new person. You looked at this child and you may have thought, wow, what, what will become of this child, right? What will they do? What will they experience? And today that child has grown up and in a few minutes is gonna walk across this stage in a ritual that marks the milestone completion of a college education. So to all the families who have loved and supported the young people here, the young graduates today, congratulations to you. You have so much to be proud of. It's a moment of joy and we need moments of joy, especially now. And specifically to the grandparents here today, congratulations to you. Can I see a show of hands? How many grandparents are here? Raise your hand. All right. There is a profundity to this moment that connects directly to you as grandparents and I'm gonna say more about that in a minute. Hi, graduates. <laughs> you look really good, I have to say. It's a little hot, but you look good. I hope you feel happy. In 2016, I interviewed 53 nine-year-olds, believe it or not, because I was doing a commencement speech back then, and I thought it might be interesting to you know, address the graduates and say what these nine-year-olds were dreaming, and you, know, you would have their, their futures in your hands. This year, I talked to grandparents. And some of the conversations I had were pretty amazing. So I wanna tell you what they told me and how different life was just two generations ago. So let me take you back to the 1960s, right? The famous 1960s. Some of your parents were not even born yet, or maybe they were brand new people themselves, but a lot of your grandparents were your age or just a little bit younger, maybe. Maybe they were 15, maybe they were 20, maybe they were 25. The 1960s, it was a time of change, right? The Vietnam War was raging. People your age were being drafted. There were protests against the war, many of them on college campuses, and it was, it was just a time of change. The civil rights movement involved so many people your age at the time. These were people fighting for social and racial justice, for the rights of black people, women, and other underrepresented groups. The Stonewall Uprising happened in the 1960s. That was a huge turning point for the LGBTQ community. Millions of people em immigrated to this country in the 60s. Rock and roll was new. Mini dresses, afros, and, and long hair define the styles. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, and millions of people watched it happen live on their black and white televisions. President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Bobby Kennedy were all assassinated during this time hugely historic events that shocked people to their core. People then, who are your age now, these were your grandparents. Well, these events were enormous and they'll remain enormous in our, they'll be in our history books. It's also important to remember that everyday life was different too, really different. So I talked with a group of people who are today in their 70s and 80s, the age of many of your grandparents. They remember their childhoods as existing in a very different world. They played jacks and pickup sticks, stickball and handball. They'd ride their bikes, roller skate, jump rope, play hopscotch, punch ball, stoop ball. One said his family didn't have a television until he was 12. And there was no color television at the time. He said, quote, Mostly growing up, we listened to the radio. 
mainly music, but also those shows like The Lone Ranger and The Green Hornet. Another said, well, we didn't have telephones until I was six years old. Telephones. They didn't have telephones. Quote, we were one of the first to get a telephone in my neighborhood, and they all still remember their first phone numbers, like Dickens 61104. There were no area codes. Some people had party lines where they shared a number with other people in, in other homes. And when I asked how they communicated, they said, well, you'd write a letter, a postcard. You'd yell through the wall. They underscored that phone calls were not free. You had to pay for each call, even to someone who lived next door to you. So one said, quote, my grandfather would talk for two seconds on the phone because he had to pay. Think about how that affected life in general, right? A common line to yell was, it's long distance. That would express the urgency of the call that you would, and you need to make sure you made the most of every minute that you had on the phone. And they remember phone booths. One man named Eddie said, quote, you have to remember, Deborah, if you didn't have a phone, you didn't miss it. If you never had any of these things, you never missed them. They told me they didn't have air conditioning, they had fans. In the summer, people went to the movies to cool off, which were air conditioned. When I asked what struck them as some of their gr the greatest innovations and inventions that they remember, one said, you grew up with nothing. Everything was an invention. But they started listing things, television, computers, the internet. They spent some time marveling about the invention of the personal computer. One asked, what's that thing when you ask a question? I suggested Siri, Alexa? Alexa, he said, we didn't have that. <laughs> Another said, quote, the thing is, the computers we had were literal. Information in, information out. Today, right, the computer will ask you, do you mean that? It interprets for you. Nobody would have said social media. Tapping and swiping weren't even concepts. And they remember polio. Quote, polio was a big event. People from the city were running to the country to get away from the city. They were afraid of polio. There was no vaccine yet. Sound familiar? One said, quote, a lot of people died much younger than they die today. They were dying of measles and mumps and stuff like that. Tuberculosis. Life expectancy was around 65 years old. Many of their parents were immigrants and didn't speak English. One said, quote, my mother was a little girl when she came to the United States. She was about eight or nine. She came from Poland, and my father came in 1919 from Russia. He was one of five children and the only one who spoke English. And at 19, he became the head of the household. And that was a hardship for my grandfather. Think about that. These men and women represented hope for their parents, as I'm guessing you do for yours. They got summer jobs and made $35 a week. One said, quote, I was a big shot. I was making $100 a week, which was considered a big salary at the time. You could get an apartment in the city for $45 a month. What is it now? One said his first job after college was at a hospital making 75 cents an hour. Another said, quote, my first job after college was as an accountant and I stayed in that place for 50 years. Imagine that. They told me that not many women drove, the men would drive. Gas was 33 cents a gallon. There was no GPS. This is a quote. Everybody had a map. You had a map of the area in the glove compartment. And another said, quote, I don't know how we got anywhere, honestly. They remember air travel becoming prevalent. 
they lived such rich lives, so much happened, so much changed during their 70 or 80 years on this earth. Today, your generation will have its own set of challenges and opportunities, right? We're witnessing the war in Ukraine. We're struggling with the impact of the pandemic. We're, we face ongoing racism, attacks on women's rights with Roe v. Wade, on voting rights, on much of the progress those before us have made in advancing and protecting our civil rights and liberties. We shockingly are being told not to say gay, and we are so worried about our planet. But think about what your lifetime will bring. So much good is already happening in the world. We've elected the first black man as president of the United States. We have the first black woman, Kamala Harris, in the seat of vice president, ready to take on the job if anything were to happen to President Biden. We have the first black woman, Ketanji Brown Jackson, on the Supreme Court. While we're living through a global pandemic, we now have vaccines and treatments. You're a greener generation than those before you. You're seeing incredible AI, virtual and augmented reality, the metaverse. Now we have the most advanced smartphone we've ever seen with truly incredible cameras. So what's next? Remember what Eddie said, quote, you have to remember, Deborah, if you didn't have a phone, you didn't miss it. If you never had any of these things, you never missed them. What might not exist today that will exist in 10 or 20 or 30 years? You are going to be the ones to imagine these things into existence. You're going to be surgeons and senators. You're gonna invent new technologies and discover new medications that will change our lives for the better. You're going to lead movements and volunteer to help those in need. You're going to write novels. You're gonna perform on Broadway. You're going to move this world forward and we're so excited to see what you will do. So make the most of every day, the most of your lives. Be good to each other to your friends, to your amazing families. One day, you'll be sitting in a seat like this, watching your grandchild graduate from college, thinking about all the things you've seen in the world, and feeling all the hope and promise of what lies before them. Congratulations, everyone, and good luck. Thank you, Deborah, for that vision, backwards and forwards, and really for being such an inspiring example for the class of 2022 on their special day. So can we have one more round of applause for Deborah Beale? Dr. Beale. <laughs> and, and now it is time to confer the degrees to the class of 2022. <laughs> and I invite your dean, Dean Smith, to come forward once again to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree. Will the candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts please rise? President Bergeron, the candidates standing before you have successfully completed the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Arts and have been recommended for that degree by the faculty. I present them to you and ask through the authority vested in you by the Board of Trustees, confer on them the degree of Bachelor of Arts. 
by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Connecticut College and pursuant to their vote, I hereby confer on you the degree of Bachelor of Arts with all its attendant rights and privileges, and I remind you of the responsibilities you are about to assume. In token thereof, I will present you the diploma of the college. All right, and now we will begin the conferral of the degrees. Joseph, ooh, Joseph Dolbear Willen, class president. <laughs> Eslam Gamal Eldain Abu Samra. Christopher John Adamsons. Charles Attila Adel. Elise Ofori Afrifa. Betsy Aguiar. Matthew C. Ahern. Louise Burley Martin Ahern. Ayad Eight Who. Akib Akhtar. Renzo Michelle Albertoni. Melissa Catherine Alexander. John Alexander. Suzanne Margaret Allen. Theodore Levin Allgood. Cameron Lawrence Anglis. Nelia Maria Arnaud. Julia Pauline Arndt. Ayush Aryal. Emanuela Aspris. Emma Julius Atlas. Kayla Nicole Austin. Thomas Scott Awender. Shumail Aziz. Ali 
Alice Angela Ball. Samuel Arthur Boltz. Mia Barbuto. Alice Victoria Bates. Morgan Graham Bothman. Jacob William Beck. Milo Rumble Becker. Alexa Grace Beckstein. Jacob Matthew Bernstein. Cedar Swag Barrel Young. Zoe Ann Bertone. Jocelyn Joya Besliddy. Zachary Mark Buchler. Anna Stacia Bianchi. Anthony Matthew Bilecki. Francesca Claire Bifulco. Jameson Tulumni Bjorkland. John Wesley Blackwell II. Lorenzo Christopher Bocchetti. Justin James Bowes. Brianna Hope Bowley. Logan Alexander Bodish. Shenny Brayman. Jennifer Ellen Brown. Susanna Claire Buckley. Piper O'Reilly Burke. Connor Daniel Bush. Kristen Campbell. Michael Paul Capozzi II. Matthew Robert Carlin. Catherine Rose Carrion. Elizanette Castillo. Jacqueline Chaljan. <laughs> Karina Chaul. Michelle Chavez. Benjamin Chapman Chester. Caleb Peter Chiesa. Yeah, 
Jack Lewis Klopak. Sawira Chowdhury. Melissa Chow. Eli Maurice Christopher. Ha Noi Tan Chu. Sonia Flynn Chung. Ana Lucia Brennicky Clarkson. Lloyd Carr Cleary. Madison Lee Comer. Micah Antonio Co Antonia Cook Wright. Jake Spencer Corcoran. James Murphy Dillenberg Cork. Campbell D. Coughlin. Sebastian Berwin Cox. Claire Elizabeth Coyne. Samuel Ellis Crockford. <laughs> Samantha Grace Crone. Annette Quapio Mendiera. Margaret Zeng Gun Curtis Hardy. Thomas Aaron Sear. Catherine Grace Davis. Emma Campbell Dayton. Henry William DeCoster. Lucy DeFontaine. Lorena Angelica de Leon. <laughs> Nora Palmer Deming. <laughs> Dominic Ian Demodna. Demodna. Emily Denker. Marta Weeks Denny. Carly Margaret Denora. Leah Dershe. Marlene Desire. Veronique Pamela Dant. <laughs> Don't run. <laughs> Mary Catherine Deemer. Megan Elsie Dillon. Woo! 
Mary Nicoletta DiMaggio. Charlotte Anunzio. Quan Min Do. Jitu Alemu Dribsa. Ethan Komet Stubnansky. Christopher Edward Duffy. Crystal Charlotte Dunbar. Adelie Samantha Duran. Adam Charles Dutton. <laughs> Emmanuel Pele Eagle. Ava Brooke Ernst. Allison Elizabeth Falvey. Nicholas Arnstad Farnham. Bridget Marie Fatsy. Olivia Lindsay Fechner Lewis. Gianna Ferrara. Michelle Madeline Figueroa. Tristan Anthony Filiato. Mary Elizabeth Fitzgerald. Aaron Nicole Fitzpatrick. Alexis Flores. Madison Brooke Ford. Benjamin Riley Fort. Melanie Jean Fournier. Joshua Franco. Cassandra Mayer Franklin. Eric Solomon Freeman. Hannah Osborne Frisch. Katie Fuchimori. John Bozeman Fuller. Autumn Kennedy Galindo. Jordan Roseberger Galloway. Zachary C. Garvin. Nicole Marissa Genematis. Michael Gertzik. Tihut Derib Gaitabucha. Nikesh Gamira. Emojin Gillard, Gillard. Ruth 
Richard Sherburn Gilman. Haley Claire Gilson. Matthew Thomas Guitari. Khadija Goher. Evan Aoki Goldsmith. Nicholas Constantine Goltz. Olivia Goodwin Cook. Brianna Ashley Goldsby. Sitesh Brata Gunjur. Emma Rose Gould. Julia Rose Graham. Caroline Oldham Grape. Emily Ruth Greenslit. Joseph Griffiths. Elizabeth Haley Grodman. Jordan Groff. Ivan Alejandro Guerrero. Sebastian Guerrero. Claire Elizabeth Golbin. Anna Williams Hackett. Elijah Hamilton. Olivia Farand Harner. Victoria E. Harrington. Alisi Hart. Julia Nergesh Hartheimer. Johanna Mary Hatton. Mackenzie Marie Healy. Andrea Michelle Higgins. Bridget Ann Hilgendorf. John William Height the Fourth. Melanie Talia Hogan. Catherine Whitney Hollister. Nicholas Enrico Holmgren. Artie Lena Hosani.
Kaylee Houlihan. Evelyn Hausman. Harina Akili Houston. Alexis Ann Howard. Catherine Rose Howe. Eric Michael Huber. Elise Bell Humphrey. Samantha Page Hunt. Catherine Chiang Hurst. Johanil Raisma Hurtado. Demetrius Stavros Iatridis. Angelise Francesca Irizari. Caitlin Nicole Jacobson. Samira Jagardar. Holly Sarah James. M. D. Jawad. Sean Paxton Jenkins. Robert Matthew Jensen. Xiao Shan Jiang. Jessalyn Blakely Janice. Jackson Wise Johnson. Sydney Jones. Rachel Eve Cantor. Samuel Misha Mirza Kasembeg. Harleen Kaur. Al Azar Samuel Kabede. Megan Catherine Kelly. Adam Khan. Logan Alexis Kilfoyle. Quinn Anya Kilmartin. Diana Curtis Kim. Abigail Edith King. Amelia Elizabeth Kirby. Leela Elaine Clauber. Lydia Rose Klein. Santiago Kling. Tim Noah Alexander Kobler. Leah McKean Kazowski.
Genevieve Elizabeth Kuhlman. Danso Kuzo Jones. R Riley McGovern Ladner. Nina Tatiana Lansden. Austin Cole Lavitt. Juliana LeBlanc. Jake Philip Leone. Jasmine Lee. Catherine Maris Lyle. Avery Jean Light. Darius N. Linz. Karen Margaret Liston. Chloe J. Littell. Ricardo Orlando Lambera. Elizabeth Lopez. Juana Lopez Alvarez. Emily Hanna Lori. Brandon Christopher Lewison. Bix Allen Lowsley Williams. Benjamin Barrett Ludwig. Alexis Marie Lynch. Lin? Lin Nguyen He Lu. Christopher Sheffield Mock. Olivia Lee Maduro. Caroline Thayer Mahan. Emily Ann Mahoney. Neil Bartley Mahoney. Mackenzie B. Marvin. Phoebe E. Maxwell. Colin Robert McCabe. Audrey Rose McCarran. Xavier James McCormack. Zach McChrystal. Marielle Grace McEnany. Antoinette Lucia McGlynn. Molly Kate McGovern. Caitlin Sherman McGrail. Michael L. McHale. Madeline McKenna. Sarah Prescott McLean. Sarah. 
Asha, A Asha Meckel Sam. Colin F. Merrill. Sohan Sanjay Mawada. Benjamin Meyer. Naomi Saleh Miller. Lauren Francis Moonen. Sarah Bradford Moore. Simon McNamara Morera. Jacqueline Jade Moreno. Marissa Noel Moreno. Sophia Rose Moroni. Isaac Stephen Moskowitz. Jacqueline Sylvia Mountford. Adam Connor Mullen. Peyton Marissa Mulville. Abigail Jane Murphy. Daigo Nageoka. Isabel Grace Naja. Taigo Nakazawa. Grace Riley Neal. Susanna Newton. Ni Tao Noyen. Eliza Ross Massler Nichols. Lindsay Marie Nonowitz. Ezra N. Norris. Henry Benson Norris. Jacob Koei Nozaki. Char Charlie Ray Nizio. Jake Patrick O'Brien. Catherine Grace O'Brien. Elizabeth Peager O'Dell. Kayla Karina O'Malley. Okay, well, I got him next. Coming next. Eric Duffy Odson. <laughs> Kayla Karina O'Malley. No? Oh, she went. Patrick James O'Reilly. Veronica Caitlin O'Rourke. Emily Catherine O'Sullivan. Yes. 
Nora Julia Ozer. Amelia Ruth Ogden Packard. Nathaniel Christopher Palumbo. Matthew Song Park. Isabella Simone Patino. Liam Patrick Hughes. Zoe Fiorenza Pellegrino. Alice Elizabeth Pendergast. Jacqueline Rosa Perry. Peter Lee Picard. Alyssa Nicole Peets. Katia Elisangela Pina Correa. Way to go. Graham Parker Pluniak. Stuart Springer Pollock. Rachel Ann Powell. Shanil Nakesha Powell. Alice Catherine Powers. Moriah Grace Presha. Heather Elizabeth Preston. Allison Renee Rossella. Colleen Ann Raff Raftery. Mo Mohammed Rafay. Yeah, Grace Rathbun. Ailish yeah. Westreen Reardon. Yeah. Garrett King Riley. Alexandra A. Reinecke. Alana Flora Reese. Jessica Patricia Reynoso. Kimberly Rivas. India Pamela Rivera. Joseph Alexander Rivera. India Elting Roberts. Emma Grace Roberts. Alexander James Rock. Alexis Giovanni Rodriguez. <laughs> Julissa Lee Roldan. Jack Haviland Rosser, Roser. Julia Marie Rossiter. Jake Rothman.
Jillian Michelle Rothman. Leslie Marie Ruddy. Alexander Reinecke is now here. We missed her. Yeah, I can do it again right now. <laughs> Alexandra A. Reinecke. Where am I? Oh, here. Caroline Grace Ruggiano. <laughs> Owen Philip Sagerman. <laughs> Lindsay Ray Salvati. <laughs> Birgitta Sherston Salveson Quinn. Matthew? Matthew Davidson Sambor. Amanda Brooks Sanders. Aiden William Scales. Peter Sheshereg. Laura Lucille Schneider. Emma Doris Shepke. Elena Smith Schomburg. Rachel Emily Schultz. Emmy Rose Schwab. Brooke Watson Scully. Sarah Rachel Seeley. Stephen Leo Sinise. Ayla Carey Sana. Nicholas Severino. Audrey J. Shav. Sine Shah. Anjum Fatima Sheikh. Aubrey Ann Shaw. Maya Madarazo Chef. Kyle Shero. Aaron Marie Shevlin. Hatim Sadiq. <laughs> Emily Leah Siegel. Samantha Joe Sywardson. Tyler James Robert Silby. Sebastian Lee Skipwith. Natalie Elizabeth Solari. Isabella D. Sorrenti. Brian Patrick Spears. Charles Henry Sprita. Aramis Jason Steiniger.
Brianna Lauren Stevens. Caroline Llewellyn Stevenson. Brendan James Stiltner. Samuel Ryan Stone. Gabby Metanoia Sukmono. Irakli Sevenitse. Long Ta. Hannah Miriam Tanabe. Ting Shuan Tang. Madison Sally Taylor. Charles Asher Thompson. Julian Slade Tien. Matthew Sean Timoney. Finn Tobias. Lisa Dariana Torres Navarro. Max Joseph Toscano. <laughs> Megan Margaret Tracy. Akasha Ayana Marie Trammell. Enzo V. Tran. Hoyen Yok Diem Tran. Emily Rose Tripp. Brendan Graham Trovato. Alexis Sung. M. T. Tashuma. Ketsit Sang Solo. Jeremy Cameron Tubb. Justin Lucas Turbeville. Jake Fitzpatrick Upton. Daniel Angel Varela. Benjamin Vasquez. Liliana Azalea Vasquez. Kevin Ventura. Jake Farrell Verilli. Lucas Ulysses Verilli. Annie Fogel, Isabella Rose von Baron, Alexandra Lee Wagner, Logan Yen, Why? Elizabeth Loring Wales. John Patrick Walsh. Anna Elizabeth Warren. Catherine Warren.
Lovisa Maria Christina Werner. Jordan Shane Westlake. Catherine Lee Wetzel. Jenna C. Whalen. Emma Sophia Munro Whipper. Natalie Kate Witkowski. Eliza Weston Wolcott. Kelly Samantha Woleen. Emmanuel Yaboa. Grady Evans Young. Ayoye Ayoye Yuan. Jay Yunas. Elizabeth Amalia Zaccaro. Talia Emily Zeidner. Adam Jai. Abigail Allison Balkin. Marissa Ann Marshall. Parents, families, and guests, I present to you the class of 2022. This is the moment you're allowed to throw your hats. Necessary prompts. <laughs> I now have the pleasure of introducing Evan Pacara. A uh, former student of mine and president of the Connecticut College Alumni Association, who has a few words to share. Camels are resilient. Camels are adaptable. Camels are social, even when social distancing. While camels are also very independent, they prefer being a part of a herd. It is my distinct honor to officially welcome you to the alumni herd, 27,000 camels who are here to help you on your journey. My name is Evan Becerra, a proud member of the class of 2007 and president of the Connecticut College Alumni Association Board of Directors. The alumni board's mission is to promote lifelong relationships among current and future alumni and lead the alumni association as it fosters an active, engaged, an enduring community of Connecticut College graduates. Wherever your travels take you, you can always call Connecticut College home. Let me begin by congratulating you on your many accomplishments and the incredible difference you have made at Con and beyond. 
I am so proud to have met many of you over the years, and I'm in awe of your scholarship, activism, athletic and artistic achievements, and campus engagement. As you reflect on what you have learned at Connecticut College, remember that these experiences over the years have shaped you into the person that you are today. And now you have an important responsibility as alumni to stay active, engaged, and pay it forward for the next generation of camels. I'd like to acknowledge one alumna who continues to pay it forward by supporting today's ceremony. Athena Sakonidis Philippides is a graduate of the class of 1986, and it's because of her generosity that you have received a sapling, a memento of this occasion and of your time at Connecticut College. On behalf of the Alumni Association, I want to say that we hope the roots that you have put down here will only grow deeper and stronger as you become alumni of this college and as you connect and connect you forever to our beloved alma mater. The Khan community is exceptional because of the people, because of you. As you begin your next journey, remember that alumni from around the globe and across the generations are there for you. Wherever you travel, you've got your herd of Connecticut College alumni traveling with you. Congratulations, class of 2022, and welcome to the herd. Thank you, Evan. And before we conclude today's ceremonies, I have to acknowledge our extraordinary faculty and staff. The success of this year's class would not have been possible without their flexibility and innovation through these challenging last few years. So won't you join me in thanking them for their efforts with a round of very noisy applause. <laughs> And as I speak of faculty, I also want to acknowledge that with today's ceremony, we bid farewell to 11 exceptional faculty members who are retiring this year. They are, in a sense, graduating with you. So everyone, won't you please join me in showing appreciation for the following retiring faculty, and you just keep applauding through all of it. Blanche McCrary Boyd, Roman Tatiana Weller, professor of English and writer in residence. Leslie Brown, associate professor of physics. Anne Sloan Devlin, May Buckley Sadovsky, professor of psychology. Michelle Dunlap, Professor of Human Development. Vicki Fontenot, Senior Lecturer in Chemistry. William Frazier, Lucretia Allen, Professor of Government and International Relations. Charles Hartman, Lucy Marsh Haskell, Endowed Professor of English and Poet in Residence and Creative Writing Program Co-Director. Pamela Hine, Senior Lecturer in Botany. Pamela Marks, Associate Professor of Studio Art. Frederick Paxton, Rigida Pacchiani Ardenja, Professor of History. And William Wyke, Adjunct Professor of Physical Education, Strength and Conditioning. Thank you for all that you've given to the college over so many years. And um, thank you, you're, you're leaving a very, very large hole. And we will not ever forget what you've done for this college. Finally, there is a last group of people that I want to recognize, a group without whom this class would not exist. The parents and guardians and grandparents and grand guardians of the class of 2022. So to all of you who are here, and all of you who are watching on our live stream, I really want to thank you for sending your wonderful students to Connecticut College and for supporting them and nurturing them along the way, particularly with the immense challenges we faced over the past few years. Because of you, they have succeeded in ways they never could have imagined. And so I really want to ask all the family members who are here to please stand and be recognized by our students. <laughs> You're all over. 
<laughs> Thank you so, so much. And now we will conclude our ceremony with our closing reflection from Rabbi Susan Shine, and then the singing of the Connecticut College alma mater and the victory song. So I want to introduce Emily Greenslit, Samuel Kassenbeg, Lauren Moonen, and Max Toscano, members of the class of 2022, who will lead us in the alma mater and then straight into the victory song which goes by fast, so we're going to sing that one twice. <laughs> You're going to find the words and the tune on the final pages of the program, and do, do join along. And then following the singing, we ask you to remain in your seats while the platform party and the faculty and the class of 2022 recess. And after the recessional, families are invited to meet other faculty around the green, but also to join us for a luncheon at Harris Refectory. Rabbi Susan. In her poem, The Art of Blessing the Day, Marge Piercy teaches, the discipline of blessings is to taste each moment, the bitter, the sour, the sweet, and the salty. The art of blessings is in compressing attention to each little and big blossom of the tree of life, to let the tongue sing each fruit, its savor, its aroma, and its use. And so let us bless this celebration of the class of 2022. And let us bless you, graduates, and all who have known you, all who have loved you and nurtured you, who have taught you and challenged you, witnessed you develop and grow into the amazing individuals you are today. May you be blessed with basking in the joy of this glorious moment. Let us give thanks to the source of life for everything you have learned and achieved during your four years as camels. And graduates, may you taste the sweetness of your time on campus, the bitterness of the time you were kept away and the salt of your tears as you prepare now to leave your college home. May you compress your attention to each beautiful and fragrant blossom of experience on your personal tree of life. May your tongues sing each fruit of accomplishment and savor the many relationships you have formed with classmates and teammates, employers and coaches, administrators, faculty, and staff. And may the fierce dedication and patient perseverance that has enabled you to reach this sacred occasion carry you forth to create a world where, as the psalmist says, love and truth meet, justice and peace prevail, truth sprouts from the earth, and justice shines from the heavens. Class of 2022, go in peace. May you be blessed on your journeys, and may you be a blessing to our world.
Thank you. 